the, the ability, the loss of the ability to live independently um, is, is a massive issue that we're facing in society. And you're seeing reactions in society and economically by the creation of these communities all across the country in virtually every major metropolitan area. Um, I think the independent living facilities vary in terms of quality. You know, you might be able to pay $100,000 to get in one. It's a deposit that you have to pay that you may or may not be able to get back. Uh, the family may, be, may or not, may not be able to get back at the end. It may go as high as a million dollars. Uh, my mother lives in one of these facilities down in Florida. It uh, was an experience reviewing the contract. Uh, there's no negotiation that goes into these contracts. You just have to understand what the terms and conditions of the contract are. And when you go into one of these facilities, you really need to have somebody who's dealt with the contracts before so that you can identify differences between facilities. So no two facilities are the same. They're run by different organizations. Many of them are run by nonprofits. Some are run by for-profit institutions. The nonprofits are a little more forgiving in terms of the way uh, the, uh, the contracts are, are drafted, but still, you have to look out for how much time do you, are you allowed to spend in a nursing care facility without losing the right to stay in your apartment. You know, these are questions that most people don't think about until you're actually in that situation. So we have, at this firm, we have a couple of uh, attorneys who are elder law specialists that if you need help, um, Catherine Shop Murray is one of my partners and she's uh, president of the Virginia Elder Law Association. She's somebody that I would uh, defer to on re reviewing these contracts and understanding which facilities in this area are particularly good or networking with other elder, elder law attorneys around the country to find out, you know, what is a good facility in that particular place where you live. You know, where you live is, makes a big difference, obviously. If you're in the Midwest, in a large metro area, there will be good facilities, but if you're in the country, in say Genevieve, Missouri, there won't. You know, you might have one choice, and you know, it may not have accessibility to you. 70% of people over the age of 65 are gonna need some kind of long-term care assistance, so keep that in the back of your mind. And then, in terms of long-term care insurance, I did a little research. The, uh, the highest ranked long-term care insurance provider is a company called Golden Care. Um, they receive A-plus ratings from the Better Business Bureau, and they continue to provide the ability to get long-term care insurance. Um, others you know, are Mutual of Omaha, Mass, Mass Mutual, and New York Life. But again, the question of whether you need long-term care insurance and the cost of it is a major issue. Chris? Yeah, I will say that in, in with the baby boom generation uh, specifically, if running out of money is 1A, you know, as far as concerns. Yes, uh, running out of money is long the biggest term, concern. Long-term long -term care is right behind it. And uh, you mentioned some companies that I, I know about some of those, but I will say that uh, I've been using uh, pretty predominantly over the last decade a, an asset-based long-term care provider where there's zero waiting period. So imagine not having to pay, not having to wait 90 days like most traditional long-term care policies. Which makes it too late. Good, well, right. So most of the, you know, it all sounds good until you've got to write the check. And then with these experiences whereby these, uh, they can come back and double your premiums, no question to ask, or give you a, a, a choice whether or not the benefit comes down. Uh, uh, Lincoln Money Guard. I've heard of Lincoln Money Guard. Now, because, when you say asset based, that means there's collateral supporting the insurance policy, correct? Well, so you, right. So, I mean, they say, you know, essentially they've brought it. It used to be a $50,000 of one single, single lump sum, and now they stretch it out whereby you can go from up to age 65. So, it's almost right. com comparable to what you would pay in a traditional long term care scenario, but it's, a, it's not a use it or lose it, right? I mean, most traditional care policies pay the money and if you don't use it you lose it they get the money that's so that's right. the biggest turn off whereas this that's, that's like term life insurance so it's a hybrid right. okay i mean somebody's going to get the money it's going to stay in the estate and it will go tax-free in the way of a death benefit albeit the leverage is in the long-term care benefits have you had any claims made under the policies that you've been able to place yeah i mean in fact it's nice because you can use either 
skilled or unskilled workers. You can use somebody down the street uh, that's not related to you, and they have a 99% uh, payout to the claims over, I don't know, 25 years of doing it. So they're not Johnny come lately. So that's they've been written up in Barron's. Great and, advice. And, yeah. Great advice. I mean, a lot of firms that are now providing long-term care uh, through their through their uh, through their platform, a lot more interest, and uh, I'm I'm happy to see that. I'm happy to see that they're because the word's getting out. And I ran out there. I realized, you know, the, the base is younger, but uh, there's enough older people in there that they realize it's something they want to provide, so they do. Well, I think the, the population of, of the elderly is actually higher in history than it ever has been. This is the largest um, uh, segment of the population today. It's uh, unfortunately the fastest growing in our country right now, and uh, we've got to deal with it. And that's our biggest challenge. We've talked about changes in housing needs, I think, so we move on. Um, the death of a spouse or divorce is also a risk that we face. If we had uh, one high income earning spouse and everything is fine. I talked to my wife about this this morning. We were, we were joking. I said, I'm going to go talk about post retirement. And, uh, and I said, uh, What are you going to do if I die? She said, I'll collect the insurance. I said, Good. Good answer. I said, uh, Well, what if the insurance runs out? Because I have term insurance. She said, I'll just sell the house. I said, You got a big mortgage on this house. So these are you know, all the planning. You know, the shoemaker and taking care of his own shoes. All the planning must be done way ahead of time so that you figure out, just in case something happens unexpectedly. I had four clients in their 50s die last year, men, all men. I had two clients, women, in their 60s die last year. And it left uh, a, just a huge wake of problems for the heirs because it was unanticipated and they really didn't plan it through. Life insurance is a key focus of this and you all can help with that. So anyway, <coughs> when one spouse dies, we have determined statistically at least that the surviving spouse generally needs 75% of what they were earning before to, to maintain their standard of living. That's of course if you don't sell the house and you don't pay down the debts and you don't have life insurance to take care of all this stuff. And that's where you all, again, are extremely valuable in making sure that um, we do anticipate that. In the event of divorce, though, that's a little bit trickier because what we can't do is predict what happens in a divorce. Um, if we're representing the less wealthy spouse in the divorce, um, we want to make sure that whoever's representing her in that divorce is getting as much as they possibly can to ensure her or his well-being going into the future. And that's, I think, an underserviced part of the marketplace. There are a lot of people popping up with who are certified divorced uh, <coughs> mediators and specialists in this area. Um, but I think uh, you know, people need to be a little bit more thoughtful about the issues that arise out of a divorce. I had to represent a spouse. She was uh, able to, uh, we had a divorce counsel representing her as well, but I was really helping with the financial planning. And when we dug into her assets, we found that there were all these uh, uh, closed end funds that had been invested in by her uh, ex-husband, and they were almost impossible to get out of. And so that allowed us to ask for more liquidity. We got more liquidity, he got the closed end funds. We don't care. We wanted to make sure we could liquidate be able to live on these funds because she was not working and she did, wasn't earning an income so we had to generate income from other sources. We weren't certain that these MLPs and hedge funds that, that he was exclusively invested in were going to be sufficient to carry her through her retirement. Unforeseen needs of the family, well, I've seen this a lot where the grandparents end up taking care of the kids. And grandparents, you know, are, they're great. And you know, we were very thankful to have them if they're able to do that. We all don't have that luxury. Uh, but more of us, if we are grandparents, or more of us who are children are being put in the position of taking care of grandchildren and parents. So a lot of the estate planning that we're doing is making sure that if something happens to the spouses 
and they both pass away, but we've set aside some money for parents who actually have been depending on them for a supplement, supplemental income. And just thinking about that, thinking that through all the way is part of the estate planning. 